inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because he was slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in the sea. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. How are you with regards to news? You know like when a friend says, I've got some news for you, and I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. How do you take that, first of all? Are you a person who says, well, let's start strong. Just give me the good news, and the good news will be so good that it will help me over the bump, which is likely to be the bad news. Now, some people tend to go in that order. I just want to start good and start strong. Others, I think myself, <laughs> I would say, right, okay, uh, well, look, let's uh, give it the bad news. Just, but I, I won't end the last word on the bad news, but I'm prepared to start there. So tell me the bad news, and then you can tell me the good news. That's the structure of most historic media news programs. Not always modern alternative media, but certainly the historic models. If there's anybody still left who can bring themselves to find the energy to endure something like the 10 o'clock news from start to finish, then you will see that format invariably the news opens with a headline which will be about war between Israel and Hamas and if you've been following you'll see the spreading into Hezbollah then the second story might be something equally as cheerful like civil unrest and unraveling in our own nation maybe some shops and buildings being destroyed then there might be, as a third story, the discovery of an enormous financial deficit that the Treasury is going to struggle indefinitely to repair. And the fourth one won't be much better, or the fifth one, or the sixth one. But around 10.28, two minutes before they wish you a good night, you're told something like, there was a cat up a tree and the fireman rescued it. That's your good news. Now go to bed. And of course, in light of the 27 minutes and 49 seconds or 55 seconds that preceded it, 
it's a pretty lame piece of good news to send you to bed on. You're being sent to nod with an overwhelming amount of bad news. Well, though John sees the exact same format in Revelation 5, Praise Christ, he ends with an enormous amount of good news. But he does, in all honesty, share and open his news program with the bad news. So we'll think about the bad news and why it's bad. Then we'll think about the good news and why it's good. And then we'll see the response to that good news and we can ask ourselves, Is that my response? Or am I still tuned in to the bad news? The bad news, verses 1 to 4. I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, right on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I saw the mighty angel proclaiming, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? No one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Not only to open the thing, but to look inside the thing. Now, we live in an age where if you get someone's phone and you're crafty enough, you can access their messages. And school place and workplace is full of people reading other people's messages. But in the ancient world where John lived, in fact, right into medieval times, I I saw this at the university, leaders, kings, tyrants, Caesars, whatever you wanted to call them, they didn't have an iPhone or a Samsung, so they sent their message in the form of a parchment of some description, sealed with seals, that had their stamp on it, And only certain people could open that seal. Not just any Tom, Dick, or Harry. Certain people were allowed to break it and to read it. If you tried to do it, when you were not qualified to do it, then more fool you for trying it. Inside one of the rooms of Professor Square at Glasgow University, there was an unrolled parchment in a glass case. I used to look at it every other day when I was doing systematic theology. It came from one of the popes in the 1400s, and it had the big seal on the bottom right of the parchment. I was always amazed that this thing sat in a room with zero security, and it was the Pope promising the funding for the building of the University of Glasgow, 1451, built by the Roman Church, certainly in majority, if not in part. And there it was, just just hanging. But not just anybody would have opened it when that arrived from sunny Rome. Only a fully qualified person could break that seal, open it up, and turn round to the architects and say, the Pope says yes, let's get building this structure. So, we move to the position where no one is able to open the seal. Why, why is that so, so sad? Because in the seals would be the edicts and the commands of the person who sent it. Imagine the word for your nation was peace when you were in the midst of war. But you would never know it was peace because you were not allowed to open it. Or what if it was judgment on your nation from some other ruler? He's coming in and he's going to tax you black and blue. The Romans were famous for doing that, but you couldn't open the seal. You would not be able to prepare your place for the coming taxation. And boy, you'd be taken by surprise. (coughs) Two of the most central things that every people seek, and maybe every individual seeks, are just those two things that could come from those in authority. One, you might say, is forgiveness, and the other is justice. When people talk about how could we improve the world today, 
I doubt there's a living being who could say, here's how you could make the world better. Have less justice and have less forgiveness. So if there's anyone who would think that, that would not lead to a world which was better. So what do you think the parchment in heaven is saying? What's inside that seal? What's God's great edict for creation? What's the last word? Because the last word is in that parchment. The last word from God is justice and forgiveness. Why is it so tragic if there is no one to open that seal? Because for nine million plus people, the last word was not justice and forgiveness, but Arbeit mach frei. Work makes you free. Emblazoned above the gates of the camp called Auschwitz, that was the last word for them. A beaten up wife. The last word, get out. Someone who's been tragically wronged, maybe in the land of business. The last word, you deserved it. You were not tough enough. If there's no one to open the seal which carries God's final edict of justice and mercy, think of how many souls live this life and exit it with last words like Arbeit mach frei. Absolutely horrific. And John sees there's no angelic creature who can fix this human history. There's no demonic creature who can fix this history. And there's no earthly creature. There's no human being. Then he comes to the good news. Verses 4 to 8. The elders said, Do not weep. See the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has triumphed and he's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The creational number from Genesis 1 and 2, as creation opens with this perfect seven, it will now reopen a new creation with the number seven. So see the mirroring from Genesis 1 and 2 appearing again in Revelation. Then I saw, and you might expect, him to see a lion, because that's what the elder has said. The lion has overcome. But he says, then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the living creatures and the elders, and with the seven horns and the seven eyes, that perfect number again. This person is perfectly qualified. They are literally immersed in the sevens of God's creation and recreation. He came and took the scroll in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And once he had taken it, the four living creatures fell down in the 24 elders before the Lamb. They had hearts with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We sang at the start, the Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. They're very different creatures, aren't they? If you've been to the safari park called Blair Drummond, you get to see in real life lions. It's one of the most surreal places I've ever been because you're in your car and there's a pride of lions running around, roaring. There is a fence, which is no different than a normal fence, very high, but it's still only a wire fence. And there's domesticated cows on the other side of that thing, eating grass. And there's around a dozen so lions on the other side. And all that separates them is that fence. And those lions roar. And they are toned. And they are fast. And they are powerful. 
and they are frightening. Jesus is described as a lamb, but also as a lion. In other words, this is an individual of absolute authority and absolute power, but a lamb as well. And when you compare a lamb to a lion, well, lambs are smaller, they're fluffy, and maybe they're amongst one of the first toys you might buy a child. I know you might buy them a teddy lion, but a teddy lamb seems more in keeping with a a little child. The lamb is vulnerable. The lamb is not able to attack beasts that are bigger. In fact, lambs sometimes can be under threat from something like a crow. It can be dangerous for lambs. So in Jesus, you have these two very extreme and opposite identities brought together. He is the lion and the lamb. Why do you think John sees this? Why does he see lion and lamb come together? Because in Jesus, many things which are different come together. Heaven and earth is different. In Jesus, heaven and earth come together. Justice and mercy can sometimes be very different. Some people can be very just, but they're not merciful. But they do dish out justice. Other people can be very merciful, but they're so merciful to the point that they're soft. And they seem oblivious to justice. What you want is one who in them there is justice and mercy. They're in Jesus as well. Humanity and divinity, they come to Jesus and merge as well. This is why John says, we did find one who could open the scroll. And it's not religion that fixes human history. It's not politics that fixes human history. It's not scientific endeavor and learning that fixes human history. It's a person who fixes human history. Now, maybe you think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I didn't think religion could play a part in fixing history, I would not be sitting in church praying, singing, reading the scripture and listening to teaching from it. If I didn't think religion could in part fix individuals and human history, I wouldn't be here. Well, you might as well not be here because religion fixes nothing. Religion along with politics and now along with science causes conflict. Christianity is not religion. Religions are usually always about what we can do for our God. Can I get to that postcode for my God? Can I starve myself of that food substance for my God? Can I wear those special clothes for my God? Can I ask to sit at that table for my God. That's religion. And that's every religion in the world. Christianity is about a person who does something for you. So if you want to be religious, then you're going to have to do a lot of things for God. But if you want to be Christian, you understand actually the very opposite is what the good news is. Doing lots of things for God is no different than doing lots of things for your spouse or lots of things for your friend. It would just be another burden. It would just be another thing you have to squeeze in in a diary where you're already squeezing in an awful lot. Unless you seem to be blessed with an absolutely empty diary and nobody ever asks you to do anything. But if you're like an average person, you're trying to work out, you know, where will I get the time to do that for them? And when will I pick them up? What time do I need to drop? You're forever doing things for folk. And all religion wants you to do is do more of that behavior, but include God. And what I'm saying to you is forget that. That's not good news, folks. That's just bad religious news. What makes the gospel the gospel, the good news, as John says, he's the one who's done something for us. He opens the seal. He brings the words of justice and mercy. 
I want to be Christian so that I cannot be religious. I want to be Christian to avoid religion. Because in this life, I've only got those two choices. Either I'm Christian or I'm religious. One is just more bad news on a busy timetable. The other promises good news. Once John has realized that, he then sees the response in heaven. The chapter ends. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. You were slain with your blood. You purchased men for God. And then notice four appears quite a lot in Revelation as well as seven. From every tribe, language, people, and nation. You've made them a kingdom of priests to serve God. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000, worthy as a lamb who was slain, to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, praise, and glory. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The living creatures fell down and worshiped. There's a lot of people there. There is a good response because if you are like me, you tend to wonder, who would I see in glory? Have you never wondered that? Who will be there? Have you never wondered that? Then you go through all the names of the people you know, and then you maybe have a boat, you go, oh, that person, they were never interested in Jesus. They, they never prayed, they, they, never, they never came to anything I invited them to. Oh, wow, I never saw them in church. And then you can make a dangerous leap. Because I never saw them in the church on earth, I will never see them in the church in glory. It's not coming to the church on earth that brings salvation. It's coming to Jesus while on earth that brings salvation. Not everybody on earth will come to faith in Jesus. That's true. But a greater number than who came to the church will. So if you've ever kept yourself awake, if you've ever let a cup of coffee go cold because you've been slightly anxious about how some people leave things perilously close and haven't taken seriously, absolutely loving and sensible advice that you've shared with them, John ends the news report with a great response. And it's quite simply this, and I end with this. There, there's nobody in who was meant to be out. And there's nobody ever left out who he wanted to be. And even if that conversation was at the very end and we were not part of a person with God in the closing set, they encountered a news report way greater than anything you and me watch at 10 o'clock at night. Thank you.